six seconds can feel like an eternity when your life is on the line. Twice a year, the United States' biggest maximum security prison opens its doors to the public. The convicts become cowboys. They're some of the toughest and meanest men in the country. Armed robbers, rapists, murderers, and they're providing family entertainment. The most popular event is convict poker. The last man sitting wins the prize. Prisoners are often injured, sometimes killed, but the rodeo ring isn't the most dangerous place in the jail. That honour belongs to a small, nondescript room a kilometre away. Lethal injection is the United States' preferred mode of execution. The prisoner is strapped down, the tubes are attached and the chemicals injected. They're good citizens in this prison, and good citizens is what it's all about. The current warden participated in six executions. How y'all doing? One of those inmates asked me, well, will you hold my hand so I'll be connected to this earth while I'm reaching up to Jesus, you know, and going to heaven? I said, well, sure. So that's how I went up holding four of them's hands before they died. And, uh, and then uh, well, that's a pretty profound thing to do, so. Is it personally difficult to be in that room and, and watch someone die? No. It was the first time, and I went and talked to the preacher the next day because I realized I just killed that guy. I didn't say anything to him about his soul. I didn't just I just carried him in the room. And we just laid him on the table and strapped him down. And and uh, two minutes later, I looked there. Well, actually, about four and a half minutes later, and there he was dead. And I said, "Man, you just killed that guy. You didn't say nothing to him. You didn't say anything to him. You just did it." There are 88 inmates on the prison's death row, waiting for their date with the warden and the executioner. I just get the warrant in the mail. When I get the warrant, and I do the execution. If I don't get the warrant, I don't do it. And uh, the law of the land is that we do have executions, but then we have to be really, really, really cautious and careful that we really, really, really don't execute an innocent person. In some parts of the US, the prosecutors aren't cautious or careful enough. Ernest Willis spent 17 years on death row, waiting to die for a crime he didn't commit. Northbound I-15 looks good until you reach around 3300 south. Minor fender bender perhaps resulting from poor visibility. He came within two days of being executed. They ask if you want a black suit or a blue suit. Uh, they ask you what you want for your last meal. When you become, I think it's three days, of, of your execution, they put you in what they call a death watch cell. They don't want you to commit suicide or something like that and cheat them out of being able to kill you. That's what it amounts to. These days, Ernest Willis hauls boats from one side of the country to the other. It's a chance to catch up with the world that passed him by. His journey to death row began 22 years ago when he arrived at his cousin's house in West Texas. During the night, the house caught fire. Willis and his cousin got out, but two women didn't. The police suspected arson and they charged Ernest Willis with murder. There was no witness, no motive, and no forensic evidence, but the defendant was convicted and sent to death row. The first two years I was there, I was, I was a real angry person. And I knew that if I didn't put that anger out, you know, it would just eat me alive. You know, there ain't no way I could have spent 
17 years on Texas death row, full of hate and hating everybody, you know? What good does it do to hate? You know, move on with your life. He did move on with his life, finding romance in an unlikely place. As Willis waited to die, he met Ferrelyn Harbin, the sister of another man on death row. They fell in love and got married, although they weren't allowed to touch. I witnessed my brother being executed at six o'clock one evening and went back to the prison unit at eight o'clock the next morning to visit Ernie for four more hours. And it was very hard to walk back in that gate. Another person entered Willis's life and had an equally dramatic impact on it. Jim Blank was a first year solicitor at a big New York law firm. Even though he had no experience in criminal law, he took on the Willis appeals for free. Well, I mean, it was a unbelievable miscarriage of justice um, that um, was the result of a convergence of a lot of bad things happening uh, all, at, all at once to a person who was unfortunately in the wrong place at the wrong time. Blank discovered the prosecution suppressed evidence would have helped the defense, and he found these shocking prison medical records. They reveal Willis was secretly drugged during the trial. He didn't have a mental problem, but was repeatedly given powerful antipsychotic drugs. He was being given massive, massive doses of these drugs. Um, two or three times the recommended amount, the recommended daily dosage, uh, for someone who would be diagnosed as really psychotic. And I sat there, you know, I didn't even know what was going on. I couldn't participate and help my attorneys or anything else. The drugs turned the defendant into a zombie, and the prosecutor played up the lack of emotion, telling the jury Willis was a cold-hearted satanic demon, a monster from a horror film, with cold fish eyes and a deadpan, insensitive, expressionless face. My view is, is that it, it was deliberate, um, and that somebody knew what they were doing, and that there was, uh, on the part of the state, a recognition that they had a, a weak case. Blank found arson experts who repudiated the prosecution's theories, and he discovered an axe murderer, David Long, had admitted starting the fire. David Long had a motive for the fire. He knew Billy Willis, Ernest, Ernest Willis's cousin, who was one of the inhabitants of the house. He had a grudge out for him. Um, they were doing drug deals together. Uh, he knew exactly how to get there. He described how he got there, how he drove there, how long it took him, the exact roads that he took to get there. Despite all the evidence of innocence, the top Texas court refused to release Ernest Willis. Finally, a federal judge said, enough. Did you think this day would ever come? I knew it'd come eventually. Willis walked free and into the arms of his wife. It was the first time they'd touched. Are you angry? Are you bitter? Or... No. No, I'm not, I'm not bitter. Uh, I think what goes around comes around. The people that knew I was innocent to start with, why they'll get theirs. He got out on our wedding anniversary. There was a car coming. She ran across the highway, and I was coming down the stairs, and we met. And someone said that we embraced for, like, just... 50, 57 seconds or something like that. Texas executes more people than any other state. Virginia is second. I drove there to get a very different but equally personal perspective on the death penalty. state capital, Richmond, Jerry Givens is indulging his love of sport. Like Ernest Willis, he spent 17 years on death row, but not as a prisoner, as an executioner. He killed 62 people. I have to transform myself from a correctional officer or a churchgoer and become an executioner on the day of the execution. Sometimes it takes weeks to prepare, and sometimes it takes weeks and months to come down off that. 
I never put on the hood to disguise myself. I never felt that I, I could do that because that's being a coward to put on a hood and don't nobody know exactly who he was. He said you're going to bless me before you leave. I felt the same way. Jerry Givens defies the stereotypes. I asked the Lord to help me to be strong. I call him all night long. Oh, all night. He's warm and gentle and sings in the church choir on Sundays. I fell down on my knees. I said, Master, help me please. He prays he didn't execute someone like Ernest Willis. If I come to find out that some of the people are very innocent, I don't think I'll never forget it. And I think they would come back and really, really put a deep scar on me. More than 90 wrongly convicted people have been released from death row over the last two decades. In some states, exonerations are outnumbering executions, shaking America's confidence in the death penalty. Oh, healing river, send down your waters. A small group of protesters is outside the Supreme Court in Washington. Send down your water. Send down your water. And wash the blood. And wash the blood. A former warden says the men he helped kill haunt his dreams. The death penalty is the dirtiest, filthiest thing that we do in this country today. It's got to be stopped. Most Americans still support capital punishment. He was we're to see the end of the death penalty. Would you like some information? No, I believe in it. Welcome to Washington, D.C. The number of death sentences and executions have fallen dramatically. It's a great research project. The exonerations aren't the only factor. Serious questions are being raised about the method of execution, and a new group of unlikely activists is emerging. Doctors. The lethal injection is a, is a charade. It is not humane. Uh, it may look civilized, but you know my feeling is that it's not civilized. Lethal injection is usually portrayed as being like an operation. The prisoner is put to sleep in the same way a patient is anesthetized. Jonathan Groner disputes that. He's a surgeon in Ohio, although his views don't necessarily reflect his hospitals. The doctor thinks some prisoners are being tortured to death. If the drugs don't go in correctly, it is possible that they can suffer excruciating pain. These are people convicted of terrible crimes. They've often inflicted terrible pain on their victims. Why should they be entitled to a, a painless death? Well, it's, it's a great question, and certainly, um, I mean, the, the people who founded our country decided that we would not have the retributive or retaliation sort of justice system that was actually fairly common at the time our country was formed. The standard that had to be met is the cruel and unusual standard, and it doesn't matter how heinous the crime committed by the inmate or the defendant is, you still have to meet that standard in terms of punishment. The states keep the machinery of death secret, but some details are known. Dr. Groner explained the process. They actually insert this into the vein, and then once the blood fills this, they then slide this in. And it obviously once the needle is inserted, a three-drug cocktail is used to kill the prisoner. The first drug is supposed to, supposed to render the inmate comatose. The second drug paralyzes all muscles, and that includes breathing muscles. And then the third drug, potassium chloride, in a high concentration causes cardiac arrest and is used every day. The second drug is medically unnecessary, but it stops the prisoner thrashing about and upsetting onlookers. Paralyzed prisoners can't show their suffering though, the so-called silent scream, and if the anesthetic is too weak or wears off, the suffering is intense. Someone either suffocates awake because the second drug paralyzes the breathing muscles, or, you know, basically feels the burning sensation of the potassium going through the veins until the heart stops, which is also extremely painful. So, I mean, killing someone turns out to be a fairly painful proposition unless it's done in some way that instantaneously, uh, you know, severs the nerves to the brain. And, uh, of course, we haven't used that since the French Revolution. Corruption is overjoyed now that homicide detectives have charged someone with murder for the shooting death of her son. We drove south 
to the place where theory becomes reality. Ohio's death house is an hour and a half from the hospital. At least two executions were horribly botched here. The most recent one involved Christopher Newton, who killed a cellmate after a game of chess. The execution team took so long to get a needle into one of Newton's veins, he was allowed to get up and go to the toilet. A typical execution lasts about 15 minutes. This one took two hours. A year earlier, there'd been a similar problem here during the execution of Joseph Clark. Then it took 20 minutes to find a vein. And when the chemicals finally started flowing, Clark lifted his head and said, it don't work, it don't work. The officials closed the curtain while they reinserted the tubes and re-injected the chemicals. Then we start hearing moaning and groaning real bad, like some of these bacteria, you know, doing something to them that we don't know. Uh, I mean, this was real bad moaning and groaning. You could tell it was a pain. This happened for a good 20, 25, maybe even 30 minutes. For Michael Manning, the execution was personal. Joseph Clark murdered his brother. It happened during a petrol station holdup in 1984. Clark took $60 and David Manning's life. I just pulled the trigger and it shot him and hit him in the chest. And uh, I seen him fall backwards and that was the last thing I seen. I, I ran out. The victim's brother still supports the death penalty. He wanted to see the killer killed, but not like this. It took an hour and a half for Clark to die. His head would come up, tongue out, back down, tongue back in, like he was gasping for air. So what were you thinking and feeling as you watched this happening to the man who killed your brother? I was thinking, you know, there has to be a better way. There has to be a, definitely a better way because I'm watching this man get tortured and our eighth, our eighth amendment says that there's no cruel and unusual punishment and I'm watching it before me. This is a copy of the uh, lawsuit. The execution affected Michael Manning so much, he's now helping a local lawyer get compensation for Joseph Clark's family. Manning's decision outraged his family. Even my wife, which is not totally against me, but she says, you know, this is what he deserved. And no, a, a terrible death is not what somebody deserves. I feel strongly on it. I'll take that to my grave. The debacles aren't limited to Ohio. It's a national problem and an international embarrassment. In Florida, the city of Gainesville is honoring its football team, the Gators. The state's death chamber isn't far from here. Eduardo Arenas witnessed an execution there. An execution where the prisoner wouldn't die. I mean, this is, it was, it was difficult. It still is, you know, it's something that you can carry with you. There's you know, no getting rid of that moment in your life. When he's not playing in a band, Eduardo Arenas is an interpreter. He was summoned to the jail to translate the death warrant of Angel Diaz, a Spanish speaker. He was smoking his last cigarettes. Uh, very calm, very kind of resigned to his fate. Well, I guess one of the things that really struck me is how how catered the event, event was. As soon as I showed up, there was a, a conference room full of sandwich platters and, and shrimp cocktail and sodas and cookies and, you know, general hors d'oeuvres for everyone. The warden made Eduardo Arenas stay for the execution. He watched in horror as Angel Diaz took more than half an hour to die. The executioners had to inject the drugs twice and the sedative didn't work. He was definitely grimacing and gasping for air. First he's calm looking up and then he's like, you could hear him say something like, you know, what's happening, what's wrong, what's wrong, um, and gasping for air. Did it look like he was in pain? Yeah, yeah, 
there were in several instances there was definitely pain in his expression. I think um, this man was tortured to death. Dr. Groner obtained the Diaz autopsy results. They revealed large chemical burns on the prisoner's arms. Well, when you look at this on the uh, right arm, he described, you know, 12 by 5 inch uh, area and it's uh, skin blistering and uh, swelling and, and uh, the execution yeah. team inserted the needles incorrectly. The drugs flowed into the prisoner's flesh, not his bloodstream, ensuring a long and probably agonizing death. Thiopental under the skin is very uh, basic, alkaline apparently is extremely painful. So one can only imagine this highly concentrated dose, how much it would burn if the patient wasn't deeply unconscious. So, I mean, the irony is that, you know, we no longer burn people at the stake and here we are sort of, you know, burning someone at the stake again, you know. You know he basically had a, you know, Joan of Arc style execution. It's no surprise mistakes are made. Even medical professionals sometimes struggle to get needles into veins. Dr. Groner and his team are highly qualified and experienced, but execution teams aren't. They usually don't include a doctor or a nurse, so people with no medical training perform complex procedures. You know, many of the prison guards are burdened with the responsibility of doing some of these medical things, and it's really not fair to them. Uh, I mean, if they were charged with doing the execution, they'd probably have a better successful success rate if they just formed a firing squad. But there was those people in that room that would push that button, that would kill him and be just like a murderer too. And I do not those concerns about the efficacy and legality of lethal injection made their way all the way to the Supreme Court. It's preparing to rule on the issue and all executions are on hold until it does. I think that it's to our advantage to be as humane as possible, but frankly, uh, as Charlie Bronson said, when you got rats in the cellar, you kill them. And there's just no reason for the American public not to be able to see its worst murderers put down. Michael Rushford heads a legal lobby group dedicated to victims' rights. He wrote a brief for the Supreme Court case, arguing in favor of lethal injection. You know, the idea that you get 10 times the amount of pentothal that I got to have my wisdom teeth pulled out, and you're not going to be pain-free for a half an hour is just facetious. And that's what we're giving these, these murderers, uh, 10 times the, the pain reliever needed for uh, open-heart surgery. Uh, they're, they're going to be asleep if the, if the needle goes into the vein. If it's done properly. Yeah, that, and that's, that's, that's the real hang-up here, is that it is a quasi-medical pr procedure. And so maybe we ought to have retired nurses or military medics who put the needles in all day long. Maybe we ought to have them do it. Executions are usually shrouded in secrecy, but a recent court case gave a chilling glimpse of what really goes on behind the curtain. Missouri's executioner testified anonymously. This is a transcript. It reveals that in Missouri, prison guards and wardens inject the deadly chemicals in the dark, working by flashlight. It's probably the first time any of them have picked up a syringe, the executioner says. Now, the executioner does have a medical background, but he doesn't follow any written guidelines during an execution. He improvises and routinely gives the prisoners a lower than recommended dose of sedative. He acknowledges having problems with some of the drugs. I'm dyslexic, the executioner says, so it's not unusual for me to make mistakes. Each state with the death penalty keeps its executioner's identity secret. You could sit next to Jerry Givens at the basketball and never know he was a state-sanctioned killer. Jerry Givens no longer works in a prison and no longer believes in the death penalty, but he doesn't understand the debate over painless executions. Why are you worrying about whether they're suffering or not? You know, how much pain are they going through? It's irrelevant. The death itself is the issue. They don't have the system no, no. more, they don't use this. Jerry okay. Givens used both lethal injection and the electric chair to execute inmates. With that much electricity going through your body, it's going to fry the inside, your body tissues. It should, it should cook. Sometimes prisoners caught fire. These days, Virginia only uses lethal injection. What do you think is more humane, the electric chair or lethal injection? I say the electric chair. It's faster, right? and just like I always say, it's just like cutting the light off and on. 
even though people's heads can catch fire and blood can burst from the bodies. And yeah, but like. with that amount of electricity going through your body, you're not going to feel nothing. There's no doubt most of the condemned committed horrible crimes, but are they entitled to a painless death? We lost about 700 free people. For Warden Burl Kane, they're not academic questions, they're personal and professional. Louisiana's state penitentiary is nicknamed The Farm. Go ahead. It used to be a plantation and some vestiges remain. 90% of the inmates here have life sentences. 90% is going to die here. All I have is murderers, rapists, armed robbers, habitual felons. So one out of every two people you see here is kill somebody. One of those killers threw a little boy into a boiling bath. And every time he tried to stick his head up out of that scalding water, he hit him on the head with a screwdriver and he pushed him under that water and he kept there till he killed him, till he drowned him in the scalding water. And he turned red like he was boiled. And he lay him out and then, uh, and he's an animal, but then he goes to church and he wants to say, oh, I'm religious and then don't act to keep me. And you have to think, if that was your little boy, what do you want to happen to that man? Well, you made the paper today. Burl Kane hasn't today. executed anyone for six years. In that time, three of his death row inmates have been exonerated and released. You old devil, you did good. <laughs> this is Bishop Tannehill. He's probably the longest inmate that's been here. He's been over 50 years. In Eugene Tannehill beat a man to death. He received a life sentence and found God. The Louisiana Pardon Board just recommended his release. Bishop, as he's known, is going to New York to work with street kids. Capital punishment is facing its greatest challenge in decades. The exonerations are raising doubts about whether the state should kill. The doctors are raising doubts about how. Death is on trial, and more than 3,000 condemned prisoners have an intimate stake in the verdict.